Today is the second Sunday of Lent, and to celebrate this season, we have a message series we're calling Attitude Adjustment. And we're looking at a particular attitude adjustment that every single one of us needs to make, no matter who you are. In fact, the less you think you need to make this adjustment, the more you probably need to. And as soon as you think you have it, you've lost it. This attitude is actually a virtue. A virtue can be any habit of high standard. And this virtue is, in a certain sense, the highest standard, the most valuable and important virtue of all. Over these Lenten weekends, we're looking at its application when it comes to living the Christian life more successfully. What we're talking about can be called the most important virtue because it is a prerequisite for every other virtue. We're talking, of course, about humility. Humility is critically important, but often it's misunderstood. There are some people who think that humility is weakness or low self-esteem, a lack of ambition, or a conscious effort to downplay your own accomplishments. But that's not humility, and that's not virtue. It's not a sign of spiritual maturity. It's actually a sign of insecurity. And when we find ourselves acting in this way, we've got to overcome it. Humility is not a low opinion of yourself, but rather a clear opinion of yourself. Humility is knowledge of yourself as you really are. And it's derived from the Latin word humilitas. And it translates into English as ground or soil. It gives us the concept of being grounded or being rooted. People who are truly humble are grounded in reality. To look more closely at this subject this morning, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're in the ninth chapter, and we read this. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. So there were 12 apostles, but three of them were especially close to Jesus, forming kind of an inner circle with whom he shared his deeper thoughts with and reflections and even some special experiences. So here he takes them on a little retreat and they go up the mountain to pray. Now in the Bible, mountains are often associated as special places of prayer or encounter with God perhaps because they can remind us of God's grandeur and his greatness. St. Luke continues, While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So this incident is called the transfiguration. While Jesus is praying, his inner glory was revealed. Now we know that Jesus was 100% human, just like us. But he's also 100% God. Throughout the course of his life, his glory was largely hidden from sight. But here, in this moment, and for just a moment, His glory bursts forth as the Son of God. His divine nature is revealed. And this is given as a gift to Peter, James, and John to bolster their faith, to strengthen them for what was coming. In fact, years later, Peter would point to this moment as the transforming one in the course of his whole life. Elsewhere, Peter eventually wrote, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the Lord Jesus. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. See, Peter believes in Jesus' majesty. He understands it, not because he heard about it, but because he's seen it with his own eyes. So back to the story. Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. If you've ever had trouble sometimes staying focused during prayer or even staying awake, take heart. You're in good company. Peter is twice recorded in the Bible as falling asleep during prayer in the presence of Jesus. He 
Here he manages to keep himself awake, and he sees Jesus bright with glory and Moses and Elijah right there along with him. Understandably bewildered, Peter says, and somewhat incoherently, that he wants to make tents for the three of them. Let's just make some tents here. Like any truly amazing experience, Peter doesn't want this to end. But even as he's speaking, this whole scene becomes even more amazing. Check this out. A cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. That's God's voice from heaven. It's quieting people. And Peter is totally overwhelmed by it. A mighty scene with a simple message. This is my chosen son. Listen to him. Listen to him. To listen means to hear, but to hear with attention. And there's a difference there. To lend our attention, thoughtful attention to someone else, to attend closely, to heed, and perhaps even to obey. It carries the connotation of engagement and relationship with another. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't want to listen, and sometimes we're afraid to listen. If I listen, I might have to change my mind, and I've already made up my mind. If I listen, it might mean I have to admit that I was wrong, and I'm never wrong. If I listen, I might have to acknowledge that I don't know something that I've been pretending to know all along. When we fail to listen, we fail to learn and make progress in emotional health, in intellectual and in spiritual growth, too. Just think, my friends, of how frustrating it is when someone won't listen to you and insists on only their point of view. Think how unattractive people who act like that can be. On the other hand, think of how easily reconciliation is achieved, friends made, businesses transacted, when we do listen. Think about what a really loving act listening can be. Of course, listening requires humility. It means humbling ourselves at least enough to recognize that we don't know everything. It takes humility to put aside my own self-importance, my own self-absorption, my own self-interests, to slow down and to listen to what somebody else might have to teach me. And a great place to learn to become a better listener is in prayer. Because prayer is not just talking to God. It's listening to Him too. It's meant to be a conversation. When it comes to conversation, it is often said the wiser, more knowledgeable, more experienced person should do more of the talking. The less wise and experienced should do more of the listening. And in any given conversation, if you're not sure what category you fall into, go with the listening one. Now when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ, see, he is the font of all wisdom, the source of all knowledge, the one through whom everything was made. So it just makes sense that we should listen to him. It just makes sense. So how do we do this? How do we listen to him? Pick a time and a place this week when you're going to pray. It doesn't matter how long that time is, but it matters very much that you determine a specific time and a specific place when it's going to happen. And then decide that part of that time is going to be devoted to listening. The easiest way to start listening to Jesus that I know of is to begin reading the Gospels. For some people, that sounds pretty simple. But it could be more important than you actually realize. You may remember, a few years ago, we challenged parishioners to read just one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. 
we challenged everybody to pick just one gospel and in the course of the season of Lent to read it from beginning to end. And we received some amazing feedback on that exercise. People that had been going to church their whole life long discovered for the first time that the things that Jesus said are for them specifically. Their faith and their relationship with Christ went to a whole new level simply by slowing down and listening to Jesus speak to us in the Gospels. Along with that exercise, try this one this week. Ask yourself, who else do I need to listen to this week? Is there someone at home, at work, or at school that you know is frustrated with you because you aren't listening to them? Maybe you could change that this week. After all, it was St. Augustine who once said, there is something in humility which strangely exalts the human heart, and it all begins simply by listening. Let's just try listening this week. And in listening, we unlock that beautiful aspect of humility. My brothers and sisters, when it comes to humility, we're not talking about belittling ourselves or downplaying our accomplishments or being a doormat for anyone else to walk on. Because that's not holiness. And that's not humility. It's insecurity instead. Instead, we're actually talking about a lifestyle change. We're talking about an attitude adjustment. And this attitude adjustment that we're talking about is not necessarily an easy one, as simple as it might seem. Simply put, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that adjustment is not only one of attitude, but it can truly change the trajectory of your life and its success. <laughs>